You may not need your entire toolbox of cooking skills this holiday season, so let's talk about the cooking methods that you will need to make your holiday cooking great this year. We want to simplify holiday cooking with the most used methods that you're going to need today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code, every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Yeah, hey, welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. What an exciting week this is. This is really tremendous. Uh, but today, this is the weekly show for the methods, the techniques, the insights into better food and cooking. This is for the general public. Everyone is invited. Share it with your friends. Tell them about it. It's a lot different than being a Web Cooking Classes member, which uh, is part of the excitement this week. Anyway, we're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. If you want to look for any past videos, then go to the archive on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash chef.todd.more slash videos. The other public thing that we do is on Thursdays at 6 p.m. It's a cook and chat event where I take a previously produced video and then I'm there to chat along with you and answer your questions. Oh, also, if you want to see what I'm cooking when it's not on video and uh, often talk about how I did it, you can follow Chef Todd Moore on Instagram as well. Here on the northern neck of Virginia, it's rockfish season. My absolute favorite fish is unbelievable. The fresh fish that I've been getting here, this must be a whiskey or a bourbon blanc. I like to do that a lot. And yellow beans, dilled yellow beans, really cool. How do I just make stuff like that up? Well, you see, I'm a carefree cook. Um, I Let's see, I, I create my own recipes. I bring friends and family together. I learn every time I cook. I create my own cooking style. How do I do it? Because I practice pro methods and I wind up loving my cooking. That's us carefree cooks. And you know, as a carefree cook, there's at least 13 cooking methods at your disposal to make a great holiday meal. But some of them you don't need. There's also a bunch of other procedures and techniques that you may need in the coming cooking season because that's when it starts to get pretty scary and intimidating, right? If you think about everything I have to do, no, 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 it's all right. Deep breath. We can simplify this, okay? We can help you choose only the cooking methods that you'll need, and then the scary ones go away, and it just sounds like a lot of fun and excitement. That That's the way it is for me. So we're going to try and simplify your holiday cooking down to the methods that you need in this class today. Oh, I'm doing all kinds of new stuff lately. This is really exciting. Exciting. Um, in place of our usual true or a false uh, segment, every other week we do a food true or false, and then every other week we do a what am I segment, something that has to do with food. I've got a new game for you today. We're going to play What's in My Smoker. Yay! What's in my smoker? Tell me in the comment section below. Take a guess. What do you think's in my smoker? Or as some people say to me sometimes, Chef Todd, what have you been smoking? So either way, uh, it, tell me in the comment section below. We'll open the door and reveal what's in the smoker at the end of the class today. Okay, we got a lot of cooking ahead of us in the coming six weeks or so. Uh, and, and I want to be there for you. Every step of the way, I committed before Halloween that I'd be live every day, six days a week. I've done that so far. I'm going to continue to keep doing that. Because um, I want to help you create the best holiday meal this year. I want you to be really proud of it. it it's what, like... You know, what tastes good to one person may not taste good to another person. What what one person likes doesn't like. It. There's just so many variables to it. But the thing that is constant is pride. This time of year, that's what I want to bring to people. Pride. I don't care whether you think it tastes good, looks good, doesn't taste good, is too much, is too little, too many leftovers, whatever it might be. As long as you tell me, boy, I was so proud of what I did. 
and you got to be a guest <laughs> at your own dinner table instead of the caterer. Well, this all starts with simplifying. And I know you're already a skilled and confident cook. That's great. But there's a ton of cooking techniques that you can show off this year. But why make it complicated? See, this is the problem with holiday cooking. The less experienced freak out because there's so much to do. And the more experienced find it an opportunity to challenge themselves so they freak out because they're doing something new. Uh, you know, we can simplify all of it for those of you just starting, for those of you that are really trying to show off this year. So let's get out the old, ye old ancient book of, of cooking methods and let's just pick out the ones that we actually need to make this a great holiday meal and we leave the others in our repertoire to be used at other times. All right, so open the book. Here we go. So here are the most used cooking methods at the holidays. I'll take you through them. I'll try and explain them. And if you want to take notes today, that's a good idea. It, just writing down some of the ideas that I'm going to give you today because it may save you time and money as well. Um, so I'll give you a few seconds to get your pen and paper. You don't have to get an ancient ye old virtual book like I, like I have. Yeah, see, I can't even touch it, right? All right, so let's start with the early prep stages of the meal, with the methods that you use to par, cook, and blanch. This is a concept I think I've brought to a lot of you this year. It's a fantastic idea in prepping your holiday meal because it saves you a, a ton of time and it saves you worry because you know the items are already cooked and reheated or partially cooked and need to be finished off. So the first holiday method we're going to talk about is steaming. People don't steam stuff. It's a disrespected method. Most of the time, uh, it, it, most of the year, people avoid steaming things. There's a lot more saute. There's a lot more grilling. But steaming is great at the holidays because it's one of the best par cooking methods. And steaming is a moist heat, indirect, convective cooking method. That's how you put it in your head. So you know the food is being cooked indirectly by moisture, right? But steaming is one of the healthiest ways to cook because it never calls for fats. You can't burn something when you're steaming it. And steaming is really good for someone who likes to walk away from their cooking, which is an absolute no-no. If you're at the stove, you're at the stove because you can't really burn something under steam other than drying your pot out letting it boil out, but you can't ruin it with steam the way you can with direct dry heat. So the best items for steaming are proteins, probably that are going to be used in another preparation, and vegetables. Par cooking vegetables is the best use for steaming. So in other words, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you might want to uh, steam chicken for uh, burritos, for something that you use the item, you put it in a stuffing, and then you, you're going to cook it again dry. So cook it moist as much as you can. Uh, when I do my uh, mini chicken Wellington hors d'oeuvres, bestseller hors d'oeuvres of my catering company every year, little puff pastry dough, piece of chicken, mushroom duck cell, deglazed with sherry wine, and sealed up in the puff pastry. Well, I wouldn't grill that chicken because it's going to be dry. I generally poach or steam the chicken so that it gives it some moisture. That that's why it's one of the reasons it's such a great thing. So I recommend blanching things, par cooking, steaming in moisture as much as possible, especially your vegetables. I mean, if you're making, like if you're making the string bean casserole, let's just say, or broccoli casserole, cauliflower, whatever it might be, don't wait to the day of service to start cooking those beans. You can steam them ahead of time and then they're a quick reheat. You know, I would steam all the beans or poach all the beans, put them in a Ziploc bag, make your sauce, your, your bechamel sauce with mushrooms in it if you want, put that in a separate container. And then when it comes the time, just mix the beans with the sauce, put it in the casserole, put it in the oven, right? Saves you time. Everything is par cooked. If you're making mashed potatoes, for the holidays. You don't have to make all the mashed potatoes because then they, when they chill, you know, they become a brick. They're really hard to reheat. You got to add a lot of milk. It gets very messy, but you can definitely steam potato cubes and chill them and then reheat them and mash them, steam them again, add more moisture, poach them in milk. But if you go ahead and steam or poach potatoes in large cubes ahead of time, and if you add a little bit of acid to the water, it makes them a little whiter, 
chill them on like a sheet pan, put them in Ziploc bags or however you store food. And then the day that you're, the final day you're putting everything together, they're poached in milk or steamed in liquid with your butter and sour cream, anything else that you want to add. There you go. It takes you less time. Okay. So let's go over the steaming method. Steaming goes like this. Simmering, not boiling liquid, simmering liquid. We don't want a large violent boil. Uh, web cooking classes lesson week five is the difference between boil, simmer, and poach. Another tremendous misunderstanding of home cooks. There's not just one violent way to cook things in moisture. There's actually three. Uh, so simmering, not boiling. Uh, liquid in a pan and the food item is suspended above the heat source, above the liquid. If you let the simmering liquid touch the item, you're poaching. You're not steaming. So always make sure it's suspended well above. Um, it's a very important part of steaming because as soon as you have direct contact the, 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 uh, with the liquid, the cooking is a lot different. Um, the best way to do this is like a steamer basket or, or using one of those, like everybody had one of those clamshell things, the steamer baskets, right? Or uh, something that fits in a, a, a perforated thing that fits in your sauce pot or stock pot. The other thing is something that is steamed, it needs to be in a closed environment. So you can't just suspend beans above simmering liquid, steam, and then leave the lid off and let the steam run. It's not supposed to be moist direct heat, it's supposed to be moist indirect heat. So this means the steaming vessel always has its lid on to catch the steam. It condenses on the top of the lid. You see all those droplets, it cools, it falls back to the heat source to turn to steam again. All right, so that's where the convection comes in and it cooks your food. How do you tell when it's done? Okay, it's you don't use a thermometer in string beans. Um, you taste it. It's really that simple. You, you, there's a safety here issue though. <laughs> First, don't, I don't want you taking things out of the steam or putting them right in your mouth. Uh, it, what you do is rinse it under cold water. Take your item, your pasta, your string beans, rinse it under cold water, stop the cooking a little bit, bite into it to tell the texture of it. And then if it is done, then you uh, uh, shock all the rest of it, cold water. Okay. That's steaming. You wouldn't think someone would have as much to say about, about, about steaming. Uh, the next holiday cooking method you're going to be using is also a moist convective method, but it's when the item comes in direct contact with the cooking liquid and it's poaching and simmering. And these are also really great for blanching items for later cooking. But as I said, there's a big difference between poaching and simmering. And remember, boiling is not a cooking method you do not boil anything in the kitchen. No, no, you did not boil those potatoes. You didn't. I know you're calling them boiled potatoes, but I hope that you didn't because otherwise we'd be eating like potato soup. Boiling is too high a temperature for liquid. It's too violent an, env an environment for food. Boiling is 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. And most items are, are fully cooked well before they reach this temperature. It's just not necessary to cook something at 212 degrees. It, it's like it's like making an omelet in the oven at 500 degrees. You know, eggs eggs don't need 500 degrees to cook. But a true simmer is a great way to cook because you control the movement of the liquid better. It, it doesn't destroy your product. So the difference between boiled potatoes and simmered potatoes is found in the amount of milky white water and busted up potatoes that you have, right? Simmering is 185 degrees Fahrenheit or about 85 degrees Celsius when the liquid you're cooking in has small bubbles around the edge of the pan, not a violent turnover, small bubbles. You can see the convection. You can see the movement of the liquid, but it's slight. The bubbles are gentle. A poach is just below that also a moist convective cooking process, but done at 165 degrees Fahrenheit or about 74 degrees Celsius. And you should have no visible bubbles in a poach, just a very slight convection. I call it, I call it lazy river. You see little things floating by. Poaching is best used for the most delicate items like fruit, or berries for your pies or pastries. So if you want to do a poached pear pie, don't boil the pear soft no bubbles, soft convection. And one of the biggest advantages of these two methods is your ability to use a flavorful liquid in your cooking. 
simmering or poaching in chicken broth or vegetable broth is always going to give you more depth of flavor than water. Remember, nothing has less flavor than water. I used to do this in culinary school all the time. All right, quiz, what has less flavor than water? And they would shout stuff up. But of course, the answer is nothing. Nothing has less flavor than water. Don't cook with water. The method for both simmering and poaching is the same, pretty much. Bring your liquid to a boil. Yes, a boil. We're not cooking with boiling liquid. You bring it to a boil. Not a rolling, violent boil, but just until you see large bubbles. That's because adding the food to that environment is immediately going to drop the temperature. So you don't want to bring it to a 165 Fahrenheit poach, put cold food in it, and then work its way back up. Have it over the top, add the food, and you get it to 165. You get where I'm going? Okay, so you add the food item, you control the heat as it starts to build in the pan, lowering it if you need to, to get to the perfect simmer or poach using the visual cues that I've explained. These are the best methods for blanching your food, but they're also the best methods for reheating them as well. Moist methods doesn't dry things out, obviously. But the holiday cooking method you're probably going to use the most is roasting. Roasting is a dry convective cooking method that you accomplish similar to steaming, but it's dry. You, you, you are enclosing hot air in a metal box. You're trapping hot air in a metal box. The metal box heats the air and the air cooks your food. It's an indirect cooking method, but because it's an indirect dry method, you expect evaporation and moisture. Things dry out in the oven. So protecting that moisture of what is one of the biggest challenges for the home cook. Nobody likes a dry turkey or overbaked potatoes, right? So if you're roasting your whole per, uh, poultry, you're, you're roasting a large cut of beef or lamb, or, or you're cooking off your vegetarian casseroles, you're, you're browning up your parsnips and carrots, things like that. Pardon, the procedure for roasting is quite simple, but sometimes not easy. People don't get it right because you're basically just putting something in the oven and waiting until it's done. There's no stirring, there's no turning, and there should be no basting. Basting is a myth. Once you open the oven to roast, you should not open the door again to help it or squirt fat on it. You let too much heat out when you do. But look, there's a lot more to roasting than just closing the oven door and leaving it alone. And first of all, all web cooking classes students are aware that your oven is lying to you. What the oven dial says is not the temperature inside of the oven at all times. So do not roast by time and oven temperature because it's the worst way to cook. How long you cook something is never precise enough because of all the variables that go into cooking with an oven that is always lying to you. And keep in mind, the heat bounces around in the oven. If you want something to be a little more brown on top, put it on the top rack. If you want your casserole to be heated from the bottom in a glass pan, it should go on the bottom rack. Where you cook in this metal box makes a big difference. And how do you tell when it's done? Well, roasting more than anything else calls for an instant read digital thermometer. There's no more precise way. Know your finished temperatures and check doneness quantify doneness with your thermometer. That's the best way. Don't guess at it. Don't gash at it. Don't listen to old wives tales or myths that if you bounce it on the floor, it's done, whatever it might be. Okay. Lastly, here's my best tip for roasting that almost nobody does. If roasting is drying, then how about adding some moisture to the environment? If you'd like to help retain moisture in just about everything that you roast, put a pan of liquid in the bottom of the oven even water. And as water turns to steam, it fills the environment and there's no room in that moist environment for your food to dry out. But keep in mind <laughs> that moisture inhibits caramelization of sugars, so it makes it harder to brown things. So if you want a brown turkey that's moist, you need my bottom up cooking method first and then you add to the liquid. So roasting is entirely different than baking because your goals are different. In baking, this is why I hate people say, I baked my, my chicken or I baked my ham or I baked my turkey. In baking, you're still using dry convective heat just like roasting, but, but your turkey isn't gonna leaven. <laughs> your, your turkey isn't gonna puff up to twice the size like a biscuit. 
caramelizing the sugars on the outside of your beef roast calls for higher temperatures than getting a brown crust on your dinner rolls. Okay, so I use my bottom up turkey method. My bottom up roasting method for turkey for large roasts, I start about 500 degrees Fahrenheit. I never bake anything at 500 degrees Fahrenheit because a baked good could brown before it leavens and then the structure isn't set and then, then it's trash. I mean, that's how you get a black hard hockey puck instead of a blueberry muffin at too high a temperature. But the roast is going to be nice and brown on the outside at a high temperature, but the bread is going to be way too ten dense and burnt. So baking calls for this precise, consistent environment in the oven because we've all had that pan of cookies that were on the bottom rack of the oven and burned on the bottom, but raw on the top, right? So if your oven is filled with cookies, pastries, pies, you need the top and the bottom rack. So here's my holiday baking tip for that. Roasting, top-down cooking method. Turn the broiler on or turn the oven on 500 degrees, brown the top of the turkey, drop the temperature to now roast low and slow and add hot water to the, uh, to the environment so you get that. But my best tip for baking is the opposite. It's double panning. If so many people have problems with, with burning their cookies on the bottom, burning their pies on the bottom, burning cakes on the bottom, getting too much of a brown crust on your cake. If you use two pie tins on your pies or two sheet pans under your cookies, you create an air gap and the air gap will dissipate some of that heat and you now you have basically indirect hot air cooking your cookies in between rather than that direct contact and they're not going to burn on the bottom. So double panning is much better than opening the oven multiple times, moving everything around, spinning things, moving it from the top rack to the bottom. You, you lose too much heat. While we're talking about baking, I need to remind you once again that most baking mistakes don't happen in the oven. Most baking mistakes happen in the mixer and there are specific mixing methods to arrive at the baking result that you want. People are so focused on how long at what temperature when by the time you get to the oven, you could have made the critical mistake that it doesn't matter how long at what temperature. So baking isn't as simple as putting all the ingredients in the mixer. Cookies, cakes, pies, some call for a creaming method, right? Butter and sugar when you've made cookies, butter and sugar cream together first. Biscuits and scones call for the biscuit method where you've cut flat fat into flour, right? Muffins, quick breads, brownies use a muffin method with, with melted fat with the mixed ingredients. So each of these methods give you a different result even if you use the same exact ingredients with them. So web cooking classes students study mixing methods more than baking temperatures, way more important. All right, lastly, the holidays are a perfect time for combination cooking methods like stewing and braising. I mean, these are the original holiday cooking methods. Back in Victorian days, they weren't deep frying turkeys, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, Mr. Scrooge, what a wonderful deep fried turkey this is. No, 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 no. They weren't grilling black bean cakes. They, 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 they were simmering stews. In, in large, heavy cauldrons and, and pots over an open fire. These are the original cooking methods for the holidays when you had a really tough cut of meat and you had to braise it over a long period of time or stew it and turn it into something tender and flavorful, right? The Cratchit family didn't have a goose until Scrooge gave it to them. You know, they, they, they were cooking tough cuts of meat over the fire, so braising is to is the way to make that large roast braising is the way to make that leg of lamb or or, or the, the top round roast really burst with vibrant flavors because you're adding herbs you're adding broths that are used in a low and slow cooking process so here's the procedure for combination cooking methods you usually brown the item first render as many of those surface fats as you can into the pan that rendered fat can be used in gravies and things like that uh, there, there's a myth that somehow that browning meats seals in the juices, that's just not true. Uh, proteins are browned 
uh, in a combination cooking method to render the flat fat, add flavor. I keep saying flat. I don't know why. <laughs> to render the fat add flavor and really just give visual appeal to it. But, you know, that taste of something that's toasty rather than not. So that aromatics can then be sauteed in these rendered fats, a liquid used to deglaze the pan, and now you've got your braising liquid. So brown your roast, take it out, saute some stuff, put red wine in it, let it reduce, uh, add some uh, beef broth, put the roast back in and cook it for five hours in that moist, moist environment in the oven. And adding acids, don't forget, um, tomato, vinegar, wine, citrus. Acids help break down connective tissues and tenderize the meat. And then there's just the matter of how long, low, and slow you can handle until it's done. And again, how do you tell it's done? Well, you could certainly use your thermometer, but you know, with these methods, if you're going to cook something for five hours, the, probably the item is safe to eat long before you're done cooking it. And that's it. That's the, the focus on just those methods. They'll get you through the holidays, right? And then you can just close the book on another great holiday meal. And you said, I par cooked things using steaming. I poached and simmered things. I roasted them ahead of time. I assembled them that day. I saved a lot of time, stress, and money. And look, there are plenty of cooking methods that a carefree cook is confident in, but you don't need them all at this time of year. Your meal is going to be better. It's going to be easier. It's going to be more fun for you and less stressful when you keep it simple. As simple as you can, focus on the few methods that you do need this holiday season. I know I'm excited about this holiday season. It is certainly much better than last year, right? Uh, I, I, because we, we really are headed toward the best meals ever this year. I mean, I feel so much from our community. I see so many successes. I read so many of you freaking out that you made dark roux this year, that you're already gathering up stock. You're already gathering flavorful liquid, making compound butters and, and making your own breads. It's, it's just so amazing. Thank you. I mean, everybody says, thank me. Thank me. No, 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 no. Thank me. Thank you for doing the things if I just sat here and talked and nobody did anything, it'd be no fun. So thank you for getting involved as well. Okay, let's go back to the new game. Oh, I'm so excited about the new game. The new game is what's in my smoker. Yay. So what do you think? What's in there? What's been smoking for hours and hours? What, what do you think? Salmon? I smoke a lot of salmon. That's for sure. Turkey? Got the turkey? Smoked turkeys better than deep fried turkey. Oysters? Do you see where I was doing oysters and stuff? All right, well, let's open it up and see. What do we got? I love my smoker. <gasps> it is my soy swordfish bites. Oh my goodness, I have been working on these things all summer long. I've been working on different marinades, different, wait, 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 what else? <gasps> Almonds. Uh, I don't think they're done yet, though. Uh, they don't look done. All right, we'll close the door. Oh, my goodness. Those those swordfish bites, I worked on them all summer long. I played with all kinds of different marinades, uh, smoking times, different woods. I think I have got it down now. So, if you guessed soy marinated swordfish bites... <laughs> you got a prize. Uh, look, and if you know someone who could use a, a refresher on the best methods to uh, cook for the holidays, please like this video. Please share it with people uh, so they can benefit from it too. And did you hear? I mean, we've been talking about it. I am so excited. This is like pre-Christmas for me. It is here. It's finally here. Cyber Week has started. Our 10th Cyber Week. Uh, were you there uh, barely an hour and a half ago? 11 o'clock every day, I unveil a new Cyber Week sales offer, and I'll be there again at 11 o'clock tomorrow. And don't forget, everything, every Cyber Week offer comes with this year's Carefree Holidays t-shirt. When you're the cook, the baker, you are the holiday maker. So if you go to webcookingclasses.com slash cyber, you can see the daily deal. It will change every day. One expires, another comes up. So in celebration of our 10th Cyber Week sale, I'm ready to make this the biggest, the boldest, the most deeply discounted, the most heavily free bonus to offer I've ever seen. And again, it's not just one sale, it's seven of them this week. 
every day until Cyber Monday, Monday, November 29th, there's going to be a new daily deal for you to grab and add to your cooking methods uh, repertoire. Each deal expires at midnight that day, so you're going to have to act fast. Oh, plus, it's not just the t-shirt. You're going to get this year's pride-provoking 2021 Carefree Holidays t-shirt designed by me, but you're also going to get a golden ticket to my upcoming holiday cooking workshop in December, free for you, $99 for everyone else. So go to webcookingclasses.com slash cyber so that you can know the daily deal before anyone else because they change every day at midnight for the next six nights. If you're already a Web Cooking Classes member, don't worry, there's more stuff coming up. It's Cyber Week. It's your opportunity to take advantage of some great discounts, but it's my opportunity to bring even more carefree cooks into our movement so everyone can cook with creativity, confidence, and most of all, pride this year. So until next Tuesday, where we take even more steps toward crack, crack quacking the carefree cooks code, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your holiday cooking success as well. Bye everyone.